Okay, hello everyone. Thank you so much for our second uh, Malaysia Taiwan webinar. And today we are going to be talking about smart manufacturing. Now, before I start, I would like to just start with a couple of housekeeping uh, to ensure the highest quality of our webinar. I would kindly request everyone to keep their microphones off before you are being requested to speak. Uh, and if you have any questions that you'd like to address our speakers, please do so uh, by using the Google Meet uh, comment section and we'll address them at our QA section a little bit later. So thank you so much once again for joining in. If you are following us, we, you might have noticed that on the 18th of June, we were talking about digital transformation. And today we are diving into the program, on, into the topic and talk about smart manufacturing. So this program is actually brought to you by the Malaysian Friendship and Trade Center here in Taipei. Thank you very much. As well as MDEC, a huge thank you to you. Thank you very much. And of course, from Taiwan side, we have the Industry Development Bureau under the Ministry of Economic Affairs. And as well as the Taipei Computer Association is the association I work for. And also the uh, Startup Island Taiwan. So as you may are aware that we have lots of uh, tech startups from Taiwan and Malaysia offering different solutions on AI, IoT uh, for the section of smart man manufacturing. So we are looking forward to having more tech startups joining us and participating at our webinars in the future. So thank you very much for that. Now, before I continue any further, I would like to sincerely invite uh, the president of Malaysian Friendship and Trade Center in Taipei, Ms. Sharon Ho. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Good afternoon, um, honorable speakers, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, I would like to thank Taipei Computer Association TCA and the Malaysian Digital Economy Corporations, MDEC, for jointly organized Taiwan and Malaysia webinar on smart manufacturing, and also IDB Taiwan for supporting this event. Allow me to highlight three key points in my opening remarks. First, I would like to highlight the current outlook of manufacturing sector in Malaysia. In 2019, Malaysia's GDP grew by 4.3%, with investment approved total USD 50 billion. Of the total investment, manufacturing sectors continue to be a major contributor to Malaysia export earnings, an increase of 65.2% from 2018. Malaysia continues to attract investments into the manufacturing sector, especially in the field of E&E, &E, machinery and equipments, chemicals and chemicals products, medical devices and aerospace. As far as manufacturing sector is concerned, Taiwan is ranked as Malaysia's top trading partner and also one of the largest investors. Taiwan ICT sector has been renowned for its ability to compete with the best in the world. This is confirmed in Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing, which pioneered the three-tier methods of chip production, and also Taiwan's recent success in mitigating the COVID-19 with its expertise in digital healthcare and medical sector. Similar as Taiwan Innovation Industry Policy, the 11 Malaysia Plan also seek to upgrade Malaysia's manufacturing base through R&D, development of high technology industries and global services. Therefore, Malaysia and Taiwan have common interests and much collaborations to explore 
for the mutual benefits of the two sides. Ladies and gentlemen, my second point is Malaysia policies to support smart manufacturing. Like many countries, Malaysia recognizes that digital technologies are increasingly important today to connect and coordinate information across its manufacturing chain. Malaysia adopted the Industry 4.0 National Plan and various initiatives to support the transition to smart, high-value, export-focused industries. In a bid to drive digital transfer transformation, Malaysia has always been supportive of startup development. We recognize the importance to foster a business environment which applies the tools of Industry 4.0 and smart manufacturing, such as digital technologies, robotics, artificial intelligence, IoT, and 3D printing. Through ready assessment programs, Malaysia continues to encourage and cultivate all SMEs to embrace modern and innovative technology in order to enhance business process efficiency and become more competitive. In Malaysia, the Malaysian Digital Economy Corporation's MDEC plays an important role in driving digital economic growth in Malaysia. And we are pri privileged to have Mr. Gopi, our Vice President, to be with us today. And he will tell you more about the Malaysian market in the Southeast Asia. MDEC also helps to bridge digital divide between local companies and international industries. MDEC has also been working closely with Malaysian agencies such as MIDA, the Malaysian Investment Development Authority, Matrit, and the Federation of Malaysian Manufacturers to help companies in traditional sectors transform digitally through digital transformation acceleration program. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, my third point is the emerging opportunities for manufacturing sectors and what other policy Malaysians have in place during COVID-19 and beyond. The COVID-19 has brought us a new normal, where no countries, including Malaysia, are excluded from its impact. During this period of pandemic, digital technologies has been a necessity rather than an option for manufacturers and companies. We see how value and competitive advantage are created and sustained in sectors like education, cybersecurity, food and agribusinesses, medical technologies and pharmaceuticals, at once electronics, machineries and equipment, R&D, e-commerce, global services and operations hub. In considering the impact of COVID-19, Malaysia introduced the National Econ Economic Recovery Plan, Penjana. This plan includes the enhancement of Domestic Investment Strategic Fund, a fund which was established to accelerate the shift of Malaysian-owned companies to be more competitive globally, move up to higher global value chain and enable company to be active participants in the global e ecosystem. Having said that, Malaysia continues to encourage companies to embrace the lighthouse concept, which is to engage in innovative and productive activities, such as the adoptions of automation and digitalization of business processes. Ladies and gentlemen, today we are honored to have a group of expertise and companies from both Taiwan and Malaysia, who will share with us their valuable insights and experience of market situation, challenges and opportunities of smart manufacturing, including ways to narrow gaps in digital skills and digital platforms. It is my hope that our engagements today can bring Malaysia and Taiwan collaborations to a greater heights. And last but not least, I wish everyone a productive session. Thank you. Thank you so much. President Ho. Uh, certainly, we actually have a very, very exciting program ahead. So we'll start off with uh, two keynote speakers and then followed by uh, companies from Malaysia and Taiwan for their five-minute presentations. And then following that, we have a uh, allocate a set of time for QAs. So uh, once again, if you have any questions that you'd like to address to our speakers, please do so using the comment section on your Google Meet. Uh, so, without further ado, I would like to sincerely invite our first keynote speaker, uh, Mr. Gopi Ganasalingam, the Vice President of the Global Growth Acceleration under Malaysia Digital Economy Corporation, or otherwise known as MDEC. Um, Mr. Gopi, I would like to present the microphone to you. You have um, 15 minutes for your keynote. Thank you so much. 
Thank you very much. Uh, you all are good friends. And thank you, Stanley. Uh, and that I want to say a special appreciation to TCA uh, for this long-standing uh, relationship that you have between uh, representing Taiwan and us here in MDAC for Malaysia. And I want to say a, a, a gratitude to the Malaysian Friendship uh, and Trade Center. Sharon, you spoke so well. I sometimes feel that when you were speaking that you have taken over my slides because you spoke about the Panjana, you spoke about all the initiatives that we run, you even have our king and queen right behind you. So, um, you know, so I have to change my slides and I'm going to now speak about what we want to do with MDAC. Uh, Sharon, very good. Uh, so it, it gives me immense pleasure to be here to be speaking to all of you here in Taiwan because I think we've had so much of... Um, um, a runway in, in terms of the consolidation uh, between our businesses. Uh, it's, it's just unfortunate the COVID happened, but it's good that we're now doing everything on, uh, on, on digital, on online. So let me speak. So Sharon's spoken a lot about Malaysia and what we do, but let me speak to you a little bit about what the digital economy is. is uh, what is the, the, I'm sure you all know what the, how powerful the digital economy is and it's going to be, uh, but I just want to put a quote from IDC that by 2023, the global economy will reach digital supremacy. That means it's huge. Uh, and more than half of our GDP worldwide will be driven by products and services from digitally transformed enterprises, which leads me to my next slide, that is the ASEAN economy. Now, if you really look at the ASEAN economy as a whole, it becomes the world's biggest... Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I, I just uh, sorry to interrupt you. Would you be so kind to uh, to try and share your slide again with us? I'm sorry, I think it didn't come through. All right. Don't uh, worry, we are not going to take this out of your time. No, 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 no. Okay, I'm going to try again. Uh, let me see. Yeah, it says an a, a thing is a cut. Okay, I'm going to try again. Okay. Can you see it now? We see your screen. Uh, yes, yes, now we see your slide. Thank you very much, sir. Sorry to interrupt. Please continue. No, not at all. So I'm talking about the ASEAN economy. So we spoke about how powerful the digital economy is going to be worldwide. More than 50% of our GDP is going to be coming from digital transform companies. And, and, and now, based on that, I want to talk to you about ASEAN. ASEAN, if you take ASEAN as one single country or one single market, it's the world's third most populated uh, market. It's the world's third largest workforce. It's the world's fourth largest in terms of trade value. And, uh, and it, uh, the world's, one of the world's fastest growing economy in terms of digital. So with all these coming up, and we've got almost US $3 trillion worth of uh, GDP that's, going, that's, that's moving at 6% growth. And I believe the 6% is going to increase faster and faster as the borders drop, as we go from offline to online, and we go into e-commerce, we go into online media, we go into uh, you know everything that's going online, travel, everything going online, and I believe that the uh, the the growth is not going to be six percent, but it's going to be a lot more. So the importance of ASEAN is big, and the importance of Malaysia playing a role in ASEAN is even bigger because Malaysia is right there in the middle, and we call ourselves the heart of digital ASEAN because we're right in the middle. And we are connected to all the cities in ASEAN. We are about approximately from about 40 minutes to Singapore. And further is about four hour flights to the other countries at the, at the max. And so we are very, very connected. And Malaysia runs three to three to four airlines ourselves. We've got Malaysia Airlines, Air Asia, we've got Malindo. They're all based out of Malaysia. And so connectivity is good. Uh, we all speak English. Uh, we have a very good um, 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 uh, common law system that we practice. So, so everything's very stable. So all I'm saying is, if you look at ASEAN economy and Taiwan trying to take a part, take a piece of the economy, come to Malaysia. And we are here, uh, you know, we're open for business to talk with you. So we've got a lot of good runway and we want to encourage more of this traction to take place. I want to talk about MDAC a little bit and where we are, MDAC and what we do in Malaysia. We started off in 1996 and we, we gave birth to that multimedia super corridor program where we saw where we wanted Malaysia to leapfrog into the knowledge-based economy, right? We started off with agriculture and the manufacturing and we wanted to get into the 
knowledge-based economy and we started off with the MSc program. And that program, essentially, it drew a lot of foreign companies um, from all over the world to come and set up their base here in Malaysia. And the reason why it's, it, it, we wanted them to set up their base in Malaysia is to be able to uh, hire local Malaysian, is to be able to do knowledge transfer, is to, be, is to do innovation from here, to service the uh, global or regional market from Malaysia. And that grew. And um, in 2004, we were ranked number three for the services location index after India and I believe it was the Philippines. We ranked number three in the world. And so our businesses started growing. We became much bigger in the services industry. And, and in 2015, we saw tech companies beginning to come in. We saw companies like Google, Microsoft, Huawei setting up the regional headquarters here in Malaysia. So in 2017, MDAC launched the Digital Free, uh, free Trade Zone, which, uh, uh, which, which we saw Alibaba coming in with their might and muscle in, in trying to move the uh, e-commerce platforms. And, 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 you know, and, and that gave a lot of tailwind to some of our companies, particularly the companies that were in e-commerce. And we saw huge tailwind. We saw big revenue numbers uh, in the e-commerce platform players, including some of the digital uh, e-wallet guys. So, so that gave us a lot of um, uh, tailwind. And today, we have generated more than 100 billion US dollars and created more than 183,000 jobs. Uh, last year, we were very proud. We saw three of our companies, part of our portfolio in MDAC and under, under, uh, under our division where, where I sit, we saw Elsoft, Pentamarch, Master and Vitrox hitting the 2019 Forbes Asia's 200 best under a billion. So, and in 2020, we have, uh, I'll talk to you about 2020 in a bit, but um, for all of us, 2020 has become a little blurry. So we've gone from offline to online. We need to get back offline or hybrid model. So very quickly, MDAC uh, has got three major trusts. One is to be able to have digital skilled Malaysians because you can have the digital economy. Nothing is going to happen if you don't have the digital skilled Malaysians to run it. Nothing is going to happen if you don't have the digitally powered businesses to run the digital economy. So we're also growing that. And that's a part that I come from and my team here comes from. It's from the number two, trust number two. And trust number three is about all about digital investments. It's about bringing in uh, big digital players coming in. So we are, we, are, we are done well with animation, with games, with data center. And now we're introducing even the global test bait for ICT and digital, uh, uh, you know, to, 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 to scale that up, to make Malaysia the test bait center for some of these companies. Very quickly, uh, so we've got five different uh, sectors within uh, MDAC uh, for the digital talent development. We touch everything. We touch from schools, primary schools, to secondary schools, to universities, where we ensure that the proper curriculum is being taught in terms of technology, in terms of digital. We also touch the e-entrepreneurs, the, 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 the traders in the streets, and how they can move by using the uh, digital platforms to, 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 to grow their business. We look at uh, platforms that are able to bring us talent, that are able to connect people, that about addressing geek economy, addressing freelancers. So that's the, that's the area that, we, we, that our talent division focuses on. We also have uh, what we call digital entrepreneurship, and, and that's where we sit. And how do we grow these companies? So we have a couple of programs like the MTAP, MTAP is about inviting people, maybe the Taiwanese entrepreneurs, to come to Malaysia and see whether you want to set up your startup here. And so you can apply for a, a Malaysian tech entrepreneur pass. Uh, it's, a, it's a visa pass to come to Malaysia to set up your business. And there's some incentives given for that. We have what we call the Malaysia Digital Hub. Uh, it is about, it's not just a co-working space, it's beyond a co-working space. It's a co-working space that attracts talent and has got talent program. It attracts companies, startup, and it's got VCs running it. It's got tech guys running it. So it's got entrepreneurs running it. And we have, we have got seven of these digital hubs, and they're running f almost full. And we've got about close to 300 over um, tech companies sitting in these hubs. And then we have got the GAIN program, the Glo Global Acceleration and Innovation Network, the GAIN program, where we've got 150 uh, uh, top Malaysian tech companies, Malaysian headquartered tech companies, that have been part of MDAC, that have been part of our uh, uh, export uh, 
in, uh, initiatives and have been grown with us all through. On the digital adoption, we have a few programs that we, we run because if you don't have the adoption to digital uh, to the digital economy, that's that's not very good for us. So we ensure there is a proper adoption to the digital economy. As of today, 18.5% uh, of our GDP comes from the digital economy. We need to increase that. We need to look at numbers that are 30%, 40%. So we are running a lot of these adoption programs. We're also quite big with the digital creative content um, uh, segment where we are running games, we're running cartoon, and some of our cartoons have gone for international um, awards. So, so that's something that we are focusing on and uh, focusing on data. Data is the new oil. Uh, so we've got key focus on cloud, IoT, data, e-commerce, digital content, cybersecurity, fintech, and drone tech in, in recent times. Now, let me speak to you about the division that I come from. It's called Global Growth Acceleration. And this is the division that's been working with TCA um, in trying to establish proper channels where both companies uh, from Taiwan and companies from Malaysia uh, actually leverage one another. Uh, Malaysia is looking at leveraging Taiwan for its innovation, for its R&D, uh, for its, um, for its uh, access into Taiwan, maybe even to China. Uh, so, uh, so we are looking at gateway uh, and, and innovation hub in Taiwan. And we are talking to Thai uh, Taiwan to say, hey, why don't you have a gateway into ASEAN and use Malaysia as your gateway partner into ASEAN? And has, because we, uh, in, in, in Global Growth Acceleration and MDAC, this is our ecosystem tech partners that we are all connected to. We are connected to government and ministries. We are common, connected to infrastructure players. We are connected to accelerators media partners, funding guys. We are connected to our corporates where corporates will give out problem statements to our startups and startups will try and uh, solve these problems. And, in, and, and, and by doing so, they get, they get contracts or they get invested upon. And uh, you know, we've got co-working space, talent, and uh, market access, which I, I just alluded to. So this is our tech ecosystem. Uh, it looks simple on one sheet of paper, but it is a lot of work for 25 people to do everything. So that's the, the size of the, uh, the, the division that I run, uh, Global Growth, it's about 25 people. Let me uh, come down to the business development part of what we do. Um, this is the division or this is the team that's been working very hard with Taiwan and trying to connect. We've got 203 partners right now. Uh, and in the past four years, our 60 over companies have generated more than US 1 billion uh, revenues by by coming into our platform uh, and we operate in eight ecosystems um, so the eight ecosystem flags are there and uh, what does this business ecosystem do it connects channel partners it connects to uh, end customers it connects to government uh, and trade agencies to business associations investors and media and this is how by connecting to all these all these different stakeholders we were able to connect our companies to that one billion US dollars uh, worth of contracts. So that's something that we, we want to enhance. Uh, and I know we have taken a break because of COVID. Uh, we're trying to keep the momentum through online activities. Uh, and, and hopefully by end of the year, we're able to do a hybrid. I'll give you a flavor of our companies that are in our portfolio. We have got uh, the banking and financial services uh, guys on the top left side. We've got E&E &E and IoT Creative. So these are some of our big, big names that we have in Malaysia. And you could, you could talk to us to be connected to some of these players. And they are all regional players. Some of them have become global players. So we encourage our Taiwanese friends, Taiwanese companies, Taiwanese entrepreneurs, Taiwanese trade associations to work with us and to see how we can grow both sides. One is the Taiwanese side, and the other one is the ASEAN side via Malaysia. I'll give you a snapshot of our success stories. We have some of these entrepreneurs who have built our billion dollar businesses from Vitrox to PictoChart. So to, to all of them, like Aerodyne uh, at the bottom, uh, they joined us four years ago and today they're the third largest drone services in the world. Uh, so everyone's won, if you look at this slide, every, I mean, this is just a tip of the iceberg, but they've all won some sort of a global award. And, and, and they're growing their business all out of Malaysia, made in Malaysia, all out of Malaysia. So we encourage and give you some, some success stories for you to think about and how you want to work with us. 
So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I come to the end of my presentation, but I want to take this opportunity once again to say thank you so much. Um, and you know, uh, we, our tagline in MDAG is let's build together. So I know we've got a lot of um, uh, a tough tasks ahead, but uh, I encourage you to work with our team and uh, let's build together. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, so if we have any questions, I, uh, please do leave it at the comment section. Now, this is just a reminder, if you have a question to our speaker, please do leave the question and to whom you would like the answer uh, coming from. You'll be surprised how many questions that we don't know who to address it to. So for our next speaker is uh, Dr. Derek Law from eTree. Unfortunately, Dr. Law is not going to be able to join in today uh, during his presentation, so he has kindly recorded a presentation for us to play back. Um, but he will be coming in uh, to our webinar later during our QA section. So here is his um, presentation. Hello, Hello everyone. everyone. I would like, I would like to talk to you about, about competitive advantage of Taiwan for point zero. My, My name, name is Derek Ho from, from International Engineering Center. Let me upload my first. Please, please, please wait. wait. Taiwan is very strong for you, you know, 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 now, now is the middle of our level, level, level with the, the support of IoT, IoT now our level, 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 level to provide high performance machine to offer the low price. price. There, there are difficulties for all talents and these on building or using, using, using not not machinery management, management and enterprise, enterprise resource management, consumer relations management, product, product life cycle management. management. As well, as well as eliminating transferring issues in this system. And, and lack, lack of path pass for whole creation, there is, there is no, no dedicated platform for the developer of machine builders, component, component makers, makers and software, software companies to deliver and, and sell application or service, service for machine, machine industry. Lack, lack of SaaS for the sector. Such, such as process, process optimization and prediction diagnostics. The, the ver ver verification, verification side is planned, planned and built with the unlimited local, local, local cross cluster and wire network. network. International R D network, network as well as, well as the future, future business community. The mission, the mission of the verification side, side is to is help. help Machinery, machinery company to move, move that last, last mile, mile of intelligent machinery based on the, the four developed developed cost cost for, for component, component modules. modules. Machine, machine, machine bio, bio and in the system, system, system integration, integration capability, capability, and, and also, also help the machine user make the first, first, first step, step on building a generation factory and then supply chain. chain. The concept of building the verification site is to meet the environment of massive customization with 100% MIT machine and system solution. MIT machine or machine tool are made in Taiwan and conduct mixed construction of night products from high size of the aerospace, normal, and monocycle machine tool is easy 
all my, all my into our uh, equipment with standard data transition device with standard data exchange protocol information model. The factory is able to apply mix mix patch and massive custom size for production. Skin skin and first change over over to the production management. Such as ARPMS, APS, yes. Also, also the the operation site, site can be developed to the standard administration of IoT platform and also security for SSMBS. The verification site is used with the purpose to commit to implementing intelligence production, construct with Realistic, Realistic intelligence production system show efficiency and flexibility to SMEs and motivate for investment and, and digital, digital transformation to verify the stability of demonstrated uh, domestic solution, build, build in, 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 in infrastructure for digital, digital transformation, develop standard IoT platform and education. To to take take of of building, building of the basic side side arm, one one hundred percent my high high edge machine and and production management system implement with standard platform and application software much much to achieve cheap different charge of production. As, as the, the global, global manufacturing market, market is moving with mass massive consumerization, domestic SMEs have difficult to meet the requirement. Reduce inventory and human resource costs and enhance the overall cost. Reduce use of product development and change over time to reduce overall time to market. Increase productivity by human machine collaboration. Increase utilization and QC efficiency. Create value add with cloud management system. The verification site will provide a solution for uh, zero cost increase and zero mistake production and zero productivity lost, zero planning time zero production limit. Uh, with those solutions, SME can achieve cost-effective one-piece order massive customization with using 100% MIT machines with the integrated of AI and cloud computing. Let's talk about latest policy plan. The white paper of uh, from Tarmi proposed that machinery industry in Taiwan should move from machine maker to solution provider by using cloud computing platform to deploy software solution to global market. Tarmi has defined short-term, mid-term, long-term goal to establish the kingdom of energy machinery by using cloud computing and big data. I'm at 8% annual growth rate and 2 trillion output value on uh, 2025. The objective of building the machinery cloud is to encourage digital transformation based on previous achievement of smart machine bugs so that machine build company, uh, component makers, software de developers, can develop digital service based on machine IoT such as maintenance, production, manufacturing environment for e-commerce, sell solution on software market marketplace for cloud uh, cloud integration to help customer to create value chain, develop architecture of cloud service business model, and the most important thing most important thing is occupy the desktop. The IDC report shows that over 60% of manufacturing or software development 
companies are planning to move production related software system to the cloud. Domestic invest investigation report also shows that over 60% of Taiwan manufacturing companies are conducting digital transformation. IoT, cloud computing, cybersecurity, big data, mobile app, digital uh, marketing, and are top seven types of investment. The scenario of machinery cloud is that standard IoT box with standard data collection. Communication and information model is shipped standard, stand alone for uh, or with machine. User can achieve the box with account and authorization information and purchase application or subscribe service in the machinery cloud. The application and service in the machinery cloud cover a wide range of industry sectors, such as machine tool, metal cutting, injection, molding, textile, metal forming, PCB, SLS, woodwork. The first thing to build machinery cloud is to build the standard edge computing device. As current, there are many edge cloud computing devices with many costs. Uh, different data format, incompatible SaaS and resource led by an app. The idea is to unify the software architecture of the edge computing device to achieve standard information model and competitive SaaS, multitasking, resource management, shared data, Apple lifecycle management. The standardized edge computing device is uh, applicable for various industries such as machine tool, injection, molding, assembly, metal forming, woodwork, and 3C. The machinery cloud is designed with a department store model in such companies can have their own store. There are many ready to use companies in the cloud, such as SDKs, IoT modules, standard information model, AI frameworks, so that developer can use those components to reduce developer development cycle. Company can allocate or subscribe cloud computing resource and host a store in the cloud. So we have machine builders store optional uh, and provide optional software, third party software and subsystem software for system integrators store. We provide uh, production quality management or process diagnostic and process optimization solution. For other third party store, we can provide like dual component market ISVS and management machine com companies. Conclusion, Taiwan has complete cluster of machinery, application, information, and communication industry, which are beneficial to develop uh, verified technology for Industry 4.0. The technology verification side for intelligent manufacturing is uh, critical to uh, di digital transformation as it helps companies to conduct prototyping, talent education, and technical transfer. The intelligent machinery cloud will establish new business model for intelligent manufacturing, which make for it first faster to de deploy industrial 4.0 technology to global market. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that was a presentation pre-recorded uh, by Dr. Luo from eTree, who will be joining us for QA section a little bit later. Uh, following that, we have a couple of companies from both Malaysia and from Taiwan to share their expertise and their solutions on uh, smart manufacturing. The first one 
is from Malaysia. So if you'd be so kind, I would like to invite Mr. Sim Ho Huai, uh, who is the Chief Operating Officer for MDT Innovations. Uh, Mr. Sim, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, let, give me a second to try to share the screen. Right. Uh, I hope everyone can see uh, the, the screen that I'm sharing. Okay, uh, just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Sim Hon Wai. I've uh, co-founded MDT Innovations back in 2004. And uh, before I take this forward, uh, understand that I have only five minutes. Uh, I'll just try to take this uh, pretty quickly so that we can actually uh, have more Q&A session uh, at the end of this uh, webinar. So, uh, of course, uh, it would be fair for me to do a bit of snapshot about the company, MDT. Uh, we call ourselves IoT uh, service provider. We focus a lot of time in deep tech engineering. We do a lot of embedded development. We do a lot of cloud computing as well. Uh, we are into IoT for people and things management. Uh, we are looking into e-payment, switching and enablement. Of course, uh, we have core technology in embedded and AI machine vision systems. Uh, we are multiple award-winning company. Uh, the more notable third-party recognition are Gartner. Uh, we are Gartner Cool Vendor back in 2015. We were also for Sullivan Impact IoT, uh, best IoT provider, uh, not only in Malaysia, but it's Asia Pacific. Uh, it's a regional award. And we have some other awards, which I do not want to spend too much time on it. Uh, of course, uh, looking into uh, the historical uh, performances of the company, we've been uh, pretty... Fantastic in growth. Uh, we've been profitable since day one. Uh, we were the Deloitte fastest growing tech companies, ranked number 12 back in 2011. And uh, we have uh, actually passed uh, about a billion uh, ringgit in export sales uh, to date. So uh, this is also a bit of a snapshot from 2004 uh, inception. And 2007, we have some tech breakthrough. Even looking at the, at the bottom part of the slide, uh, we have filed 38 IP, so some of them are involving uh, miniaturization and cost down of uh, component, uh, including NFC, and using uh, yarn as uh, a propagation antenna, uh, material for antenna, especially uh, going into apparel-based uh, RFID. Uh, we started digitalizing our clients, uh, started with heavy machineries, heavy industry, companies like cement and steel. Uh, 2009, we started to do ex export sales. Uh, we've been, we've been uh, having quite a regional presence, if not global, uh, especially Far East, China, Taiwan, Hong Kong. Uh, we have a lot of coverage in Indonesia and Australia in the early days. And, and uh, in 2012, uh, we began transforming NM, um, multinational factories. Some of our key clients are Fortune 500 companies like um, Freescale Semiconductor, NXP Semiconductor and Infineon Semiconductor. And uh, 2015, uh, we've got some major milestones surpassing 100 million sales. Uh, two years later, we doubled up the sales to 200 million and expanded to, to Africa. And uh, I think one of the key highlights that I want to talk about, which is why we are here today to talk about smart manufacturing. Uh, 2019, last year, we established a smart factory producing RFID tech with the capacity of 1 billion capacity uh, production uh, capacity per year. And uh, I think 2020, with the COVID-19 happening, I think a lot of uh, people are, are looking into digital acceleration, uh, which I think uh, to us is no break at all, despite uh, most of us are working from home. Uh, we are constantly being contacted by factories and SME owners, you know, to actually look at how we can help them, you know, in digital transformation. So this is a bit of snapshot of a company. And of course, uh, the benefits of a uh, smart uh, manufacturing is always be there. Uh, of course, unfortunately, there are uh, statistics showing that not, not many businesses are ready to actually fully uh, adopting digital transformation. And uh, if the statistics is right, uh, the source of uh, raconteur uh, is only 4% uh, that is being published that uh, SMEs are ready or even the industries are ready to look into digital transformation. So uh, the, the, the philosophy of MDT, uh, we are always looking into cutting back uh, the pain point and also the obstacle uh, to help organizations to leap into digital. How we do that, uh, we have actually uh, eight rules or eight uh, steps. Uh, first and foremost, uh, rule number one, uh, we, we try to do retrofitting solutions. Uh, 
fan of uh, the factories that have uh, very old machines still doing well. Uh, we are not talking about throwing away the older machines. So this is where we come in uh, due to the fact that we are pretty good in miniaturization, cost down, and also uh, retrofitting of uh, wireless connectivity solutions. So we try to look into machines on how we can connect to them and collect data points out of these machines. You know, so this is part one. So we, we have been um, very much sought after by a lot of uh, factories and, and uh, organizations looking into upgrading some of the existing infrastructure, manufacturing infrastructure into something that is connectable. So of course, uh, Mathieu, uh, when you are connectable, you're converting analog behavior, analog data points into digital. This is very, very important. Uh, we have uh, uh, sensors being bolted on. We have wireless communication. We are, we are pretty agnostic. I think a lot of people talk about IoT platform, you know, the need of standardization uh, to MDT. Our, our philosophy is always about you know, whichever solutions or technology that works, uh, that is where we want to go for. So we, we are not too concerned about standards. Uh, of course, it would be good uh, to have standards where, when we're talking about um, a full uh, manufacturing supply chain, you know, when you have ancillary uh, manufacturing supplies, you know, coming in like just in time manufacturing or Kanban uh, uh, solutions, you know, that is where you may need some form of uh, standardization. But to us, I think uh, we have to start somewhere. And our clients want to start somewhere, so we are agnostic in the types of technology and platform. So with that, of course, if you see the bottom pictures, you know we have actually uh, uh, so-called case studies on how these machines, the older machines, are actually connected, you know, by actually bolting on sensors or even RFID readers to read incoming uh, raw materials that are being fed into the machines. Uh, of course, uh, when you have done retrofitting, you know, then you need to have interoperability, interoperability in, the, in the IoT. So you look at the video. I'm not sure whether the sound is annoying, uh, but these are the samples of how uh, our solution has actually retrofitted some of the infrastructure uh, so that they are connectable. Uh, people can see the raw material, you know, and, you know, the machines are actually becoming smarter. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the, the few uh, first three slides, you know, we talk about uh, connecting to machines. Uh, of course, there are more to that in the manufacturing environment. You know, they are always about people in the industry, people in the factory. So it's also a, a very good data points for smart manufacturing, whereby if you are able to measure performances and the flow of your of your operators in a factory. So we are we have in that case studies in people management we started uh, tracing school children doing footfall counting you know and i think uh, uh, through the experience that we have uh, since 2009 uh, we are expanding it into factories uh, we measure workers involvement uh, it, it's not really infringing infringement of uh, privacy uh, the, the, it's part of the industry 4.0 4, 4 whereby workers need to be measured uh, there are many reasons behind it. For example, we have um, occupational diseases uh, that can be uh, incurred, you know, like um, hearing loss and musculoskeletal disorders uh, due to the work. And uh, there will be injuries that burden the healthcare and the insurance. And deaths, you know, are always a taboo thing in manufacturing. So uh, we are introducing, introducing solutions that will be able to ensure occupational health and safety so things like uh, variables uh, are very important. We track and trace where they are, especially field workers, talking about construction, talking about mining workers, or even the operators in a factory. They need to be measured based on their movement, their performances, uh, whether they are attending to work, disciplinary issue, and et cetera. So those are the things that we do as well in addition to actually connecting to, to machines. And of course, uh, uh, another case study is actually uh, if, if uh, 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 putting on a wearable is not something that is doable. Uh, there's always an option whereby linen-based RFID tag uh, are being sewn into apparels. So one of the biggest case studies that we have is Infineon factory in Malacca, uh, whereby all their smocks are actually sewn with RFID uh, um, linen tag, you know, uh, uh, supplied by MDT. Uh, first and foremost, it allows them to actually detect uh, who have entered the manufacturing plant. Secondly, whether they have done their ESD discharge check. So these are the areas that we look into. Of course, you know, these mocks are uh, being washed and, and, and being 
redistributed to to the staff you know so identification and proper identification uh, toward, towards the staff is going to be also a very essential part of the of the uh, managing of, of smokes uh, so of course uh, once you have uh, uh, people they are connected rule number five is actually about your fixtures you know so one of these video that i'm highlighting i don't know whether you could have seen it uh it's a very classical example whereby a forklift driver bang on the um the rack the warehouse rack uh, resulting in a uh, um, domino effect uh that person got killed so uh so this is a classic example whereby how we actually use a uh, wireless sensors stick and go kind of approach whereby we are able to measure uh, some of the uh, performances and also integrity of the uh, fixtures and the sets that are available in, in, in the factory. So this is also one good data point that can be fed into the cloud, uh, into the manufacturing resource planning software to, a, to enable the operators and the managers to actually look at the performances of the factory. Uh, so uh, this is uh, uh, one of the um, uh, case studies uh, uh, elaborate, elaborating what I've uh, uh, actually highlighted just now uh, on, on warehouse management, or rack, racking management, whereby a software will actually, you know, kind of uh, create an alert, you know, if uh, some collision happens, you know, uh, in, in factory. So this also applies to the safety of human being, for example, a collision between uh, the fog leaf or any movable, movable machines, you know, colliding with uh, people can also be alerted, you know, by using accelerometers, wireless accelerometers and gyroscopes. Okay, so of course, uh, rule number six, you know, once you have all this in place, uh, the always, uh, always the, the, the most important part of it is how we actually merge the, uh, the mechanical part uh, into, into electronics. So this is where we actually uh, design smart arms you know uh, there are robotics uh, uh, so-called arms that can actually do some human related job for example as simple as push button emergency push button which is actually available uh, to uh, at most of the machines uh, uh, for emergency purposes uh, are often being powered or often being uh, operated by human but uh, with the introduction of robotic arms and mechanical smart arms you, know, you can actually uh, cut down the need of having a person to monitor the production machine 24 by 7. So that is how we actually introduce uh, some of these mechanical arms in order to manage machines and machineries. Of course, I think uh, we have uh, Dr. Yong, which will be speaking about AGVs. You know, their company are uh, pretty good at that. Uh, so I'll leave it to him to explain more. Uh, of course, uh, when you have uh, Rule 6 being done, uh, which is uh, mechanically connected, uh, then you start to do data logging. This is where we come from with uh, uh, either on-premise or on cloud-based uh, connection. Uh, of course, we are uh, well aware that a lot of factories are uh, still pretty much taboo when they talk about shifting the entire data to cloud. Uh, this is where we are pretty flexible on that. You know, we are actually uh, able to look into on-premise solution as well. Uh, as long as we got all these things connected. So, so uh, this is where we start logging data. We start actually providing data points uh, to provide, uh, to, to actually give some descriptive analysis to the operators and, and the, the factory managers on what is happening uh, with the, the, the factory itself. Uh, of course, the holy grail of Industry 4.0 will always be AI, big data analytics, you know, so that is where we come in with rule number eight, you know, we come in with our own cognitive computing by using design or experiment and genetic algorithm methodology in order to collect and propagate and process data points that we have collected from our uh, embedded engineering uh, to give a very complex um, uh, output on what will be the prediction of the factory it's going to be. So, uh, so that that will give actually a, a very holistic uh, A to Z A to Z um, uh, uh, coverage on IoT and and industry uh, revolution uh, digitalization of factory, and uh, we believe that uh, our approach uh, are fast being adopted by a lot of uh, industry due to the fact that we don't come in always you know with a, with with something a solution that costs an arm or a leg. Uh, always look into starting from small retrofitting, you know, doing data collections, data points, creating new data points, analyzing and converting analog behavior into digital. So these are things. Uh, these are the things how we actually uh, help the factories to to convert uh, into digital 
uh, transformation. So being an operator of the factory ourselves, uh, we we actually produce uh, 35 million pieces of RFID inlays to date uh, out of the 1 billion uh, capacity that we have. Uh, we have started to look into a lot of uh, digitalization by actually measuring the incoming traffic of human being by using uh, machine visions, uh, uh, checking the output of the um, uh, RFID tag by using uh, AI as well, machine vision, you know, to check the quality and etc. So these are the, the exact um, real life experience that we are doing on our own factory ourselves. So of course there are many more success stories. I'm not going to talk too much on that. Uh, just uh, some uh, highlights, you know, how TV cells are connectable now. You know, so the production of power is actually very well taken care of. You know, Honey is a delivery chain on some power stickle. They have gone uh, into digital transformation, you know, but I'm not going to talk too much on that. Just a bit of uh, takeaway. Uh, uh, I think uh, we all always imagine how much is safe uh, if we can just cut a certain, certain percentage of cost. You know, so this is actually a source uh, coming from GE, whereby if you save 1% uh, of uh, the operation, it is actually a billion dollar savings, you know, estimated over 15 years. So I think uh, with the COVID-19 uh, coming in and it, it should stay, uh, we don't, I, I don't foresee that we have a short-term solution on how we can get back to, to old normal. I think there's no more old normal as mentioned by WHO. I think a lot of factories are uh, uh, rushing to, to look into digital transformation and industry. This is where I think uh, MDT can also play a very big role. And I think collaboration with the Taiwanese counterpart, I think probably we can even do something bigger. So I think with that, uh, I end my um, presentation. Uh, so back to David. Thank you so much, Mr. Sim, for that very comprehensive keynote. Uh, so following that, we will have uh, Isabel, the general manager from the marketing division of Kerry. TJ Logistics. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. It is very nice and a very good coincidence that my session is right after Mr. Sim because he actually talks about a lot of uh, smart logistics uh, equipment or vehicles that we may be using uh, in the logistics industry. So my session here today, of course, we talk about smart manufacturing. So one of the key is actually how you manage your supply chain. So uh, we do have a lot of customers that are in manufacturing industries or uh, high-tech industries. So uh, today I will be talking about more of smart logistics and how smart logistics can support uh, smart manufacturing. So first of all, uh, I would like to introduce um, Kerry to all. Okay, so uh, first to let you know that it's our global presence. Uh, and also, I guess that's why we are here. Uh, I'm here because uh, we want to talk about our global presence so that we could help not only for Taiwanese companies, but also Malaysian and uh, another Asian companies worldwide. So we have uh, presence in 55 countries and territories and also 46,000 employees around the world. Uh, not only this, we are uh, having all kinds of supports to the manufacturing industry. Um, this is a brief introduction of Kerry TJ Logistics, so I won't go through the detail if you are interested in more detail on the company, uh, I, I, I'm sure TCA can share. So we're in the market for more than 60 years. Um, this is something you might be interested in, that we do serve pharma, uh, industry manufacturing customers, uh, FMB customers and FMCG. So you can see from the screen that we do offer international freight forwarding business from air freight, ocean freight, uh, custom brokerage, uh, up to it's like one-stop solutions that you could have all the way from your uh, point to point that from where you export your products or even in your factories, uh, and then through uh, sea freight, ocean freight, or air freight, and then to domestic order, warehousing, uh, pick and pack, uh, quality control, uh, even all the deliveries and everything. So later on, I will talk about more details on how we serve um, the manufacturing industry. So this is what we are. Um, some of you may know, may heard about Carry in Southeast Asia, which is also a, a large entity that we are, have a large presence in Malaysia, uh, Singapore, and uh, Thailand and Vietnam, and of course the whole APEC uh, countries. So uh, as you can see, we are serving our customers uh, for LTL, Express, 
uh, an assembling service, which is very interesting. Uh, I would like to share a little bit more. Uh, we do have customers that uh, they have parts in our warehouse. Uh, and then through all the, for example, AGVs, uh, smart arms that Mr. Sim just talked about, uh, we smartly uh, leverage all this smart logistics uh, equipment to serve our customers. What, why we are here uh, in this session is because I would like to share a concept that if you want to uh, streamline your supply chain or to focus on your core business, spend more uh, efforts, resources on your core business, uh, you can leverage a good partners of your uh, supply chain uh, of a supply chain experts that if you outsource or share this uh, spare the time and spare the resources to focus on how you can increase your revenue i think that would be also a smart solution so uh, talking about this i will talk about more on how we serve our customers so as you can see in the picture um, the left hand side, the second column, you can see most of the manufacturing customers or even more. You can see on the right hand side, we do have also cold chain facilities. Uh, and also for the manufacturing customers, we do all the quality controls and we customize the solutions and we even do the RMA. So we do have customers who would like to leverage uh, maybe a lower cost on the warehouse, on the uh, assets, which set up a warehouse in the Southeast Asia and then they export to Taiwan or other countries that uh, to do their assemblings or their final last mile deliveries. So with that, uh, leverage our solutions in the whole supply chain network. You can outsource all these efforts and then we also help you to optimize how you can you know, use the limited or most efficient resources to manage your supply chain. So uh, all these details I won't go through, because we have limited time, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about the smart solutions that we have uh, for this logistic industry. So with all the equipment that you may be hearing from the last sessions or maybe the coming sessions, uh, we leverage all this, uh, even like RFIDs, uh, all the monitoring systems and all the IoT systems that we connect your supply chain together and then support you. You know where you can trace your goods, how you manage your returns, uh, how I manage your IMA and how you store it, or even we have 24 hours security to you know do all this um, the logistic warehousing works and also do value added services and do the labeling everything for it, our clients. So these are some of our clients, uh, just few examples of our clients and also what we've been doing for them. Uh, not only the logistic itself, but also the tracking. Uh, GPS, uh, mobile, all this IoT related, and also we do serve as a data analysis uh, support partners. So that's all for Carry TJ Logistics. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Isabel, for that uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, great. So following that, uh, we have Dr. Yun, uh, who is the co-founder for DF Automations and Robot Robotics. Uh, Dr. Yun, thank you. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Let me share my slide for a while. Can you see the slide? Yes. Yes. We okay, can. good. Yeah, so good afternoon to everyone. A uh, great honor to be here. So my name is Siong. I'm actually a professor, associate professor in UTM. I also co-founded a few company with my student and my partners. So one of the company that I'd like to introduce is DF Automation. Um, I'm a small company. I mean, compared to MDT and also uh, Carry, we are pretty much very, very small. And start, we are the start, startup stages. But uh, yeah, I hope that actually, uh, again, what mentioned by MDT and also Carry is really resonant to us because we built a product actually relevant to industry 4.0 in part of a big smart manufacturing i mean we have our headquarters in johor baru malaysia uh, we have branches in Penang and kl our main business is really in design manufacturing marketing and servicing autonomous mobile robot system and provide the full solution i'll just go very quick this is us tf we have about uh, 60 staff three branches a few more countries we are a very young team at this moment, about 27 average of age. 
Uh, just to go deep into the problem statement that we try to solve, just go for a general audience. I mean, our customer are mostly a manufacturing mm -hmm. plant is huge, sometimes as big as 20,000 square meter. And of course, thousands of goods are being moved uh, in a day. I mean, in the manufacturing, you need to take from the warehouse to the production line. After you finish, you have uh, finished good to the lorry and whatnot. If you're in the warehouse, then you have uh, orientation, you need to put into different racks. So all this, you need uh, things to be moved. What happens is most of uh, manufacturing company or factory, they actually hire operator or human to do the job. They need to walk up to some like three kilometer and carry up to five hundred kg. So this is a low skill job, human factor and cost. So this is where we use robot and AMR HV is not something new. It's been there for a bit for a while. But again, what happened now is how this robot can communicate with other machine. So we actually develop our own uh, software. Basically, it's a software to program the robot. Uh, it can easily be connected to other machine, other system. Uh, yeah. So I just skip this. This is the brain of the robot we call NetWiz. It's actually designed by us. Again, with the software that we have, again, the brain, then we can actually build a lot more different robots for different purposes. For example, this is Zalfa model. It can carry up to 100, 300, and 500 kg, depending on the customer. And the same software, then we have customer requests for different application that we can define accordingly. So this is where the collaboration comes along with us because in the factory, we need to talk to the ERP system. We may need to talk to the RFID. We may need to talk to the robot and so on. So all work together as a one big team to provide the business uh, solution. So these are some of the application. I mean, this is one robot that can be used for uh, different kind of uh, scenario because customer always have a different business requirement. Uh, they may need conveyor, they may need towing, or they want to hold a uh, pallet. These are some of client uh, that we have. This one in Ho Chi Minh, they carry uh, thoroughly automatically, and we attach connected to your ERP system. This is in Malaysia. This one in Vietnam as well, carry up to 300 kg garment. You can see that garment industry is a very conventional factory. Now they start to use robot, they start to digitize the, uh, their factory. Uh, this one is in a semicon company to bring a very high value components. And again, like I mentioned early on, slowly they use a lot more robot than this AGV or AMI, they actually can talk to each other. So there is a little bit of intelligence about traffic control. You can get the data. They can talk to each other. Even they can communicate with the door to open up to them. In the past, the human need to open the door, but now the robot can command the road, door and the leaf uh, to open up. Yeah. So this is really some recognition of uh, AGB or MMR. And of course, Again, it's not a new technology, but people start to be innovative and the demand moving on to different industry. In these cases, you can see that this is in the sushi restaurant. When you order a special sushi, I mean, normally you take the sushi for the conveyor. This is a pretty standard. But then if you order a special one, normally the chef send you the food. But this time we use a robot to send you the food. So once it's delivered, the robot will go back and we can have all kind of a data. For example, which table are being served, what kind of food they like it. Yeah. And this is also another thing that we did at our uh, office. We have actually multiple robots are uh, working on uh, same uh, solution, but yet they are not colliding with each other. Everything is being uh, assigned. So we have our own different management. So you can imagine that in a big, huge factory, sometimes you need up to 20 or 30 robots talking to a few industrial robot arm, machine, I5D, all this can be done actually. Yeah, so these are some of our customer portfolio in the past. We are in Singapore, Malaysia, Mexico, India. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is our customer. So I want to share a little bit on what, what happened COVID-19 uh, recently. I mean, DF Automation, we designed robot for industry. So during the MCO, actually, to be honest, we were thinking that can we do something for the hospital because it was quite... Uh, quite sad that actually the frontliner are facing all kinds of risks. So then we start to think we can actually build some robot using the same platform to deliver food. Then we reduce the risk for doctors and nurses to send the food. And moving forward, actually, we also do cleaning robot, disinfection robot, and also telepresent. 
These are some of it. This robot was sent to Hospital UKM. I've been there for a couple uh, for a while, and it was featured in newspaper as well. And this robot was called as a Machikia. And this robot was sent to MIPES. It's one of the largest uh, temporary hospital to host COVID-19 patients. It served up to 400 patients at one time. Uh, right now, the MIPES already closing. It's been serving for, I think, close to one or two months already. Uh, this has really helped them to reduce, number one, the nurses to send the food. Number two is actually the nurses doesn't have to walk because that hall is very, very big. One day, they need to walk like a couple of kilometers just to send the food. Yeah, I mean, this is our roadmap. If you look into in the past, we were small, we were young, but along the way, we grow. In fact, we grow with the demand. When there is a customer demand, we see the market potential. We actually design the robot accordingly. And this is something a little bit futuristic. We are working on uh, AR, virtual reality, a little bit of uh, AI. I mean, we built robot AGV to deliver from point A to point B, but at the same time also, we want to understand further than that. For example, I can wear the Google Glass. I can actually see what is the component inside. Then if I am, I send this robot to some far, far away, I don't have a people there, I can send just a, uh, using phone or google vr glasses they can see and there is a step-by-step -step how to service a robot uh, so this is something that we are actually working on it hopefully one or two years down the road we are able to provide these services to our customer and yeah i think that pretty much uh, five minutes so if you are interested well feel welcome to contact me and email me thank you very much pass to you back david thank you so much dr yong for your presentation and lastly but not least, we have Daniel from Microsoft uh, for his presentation. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you, David. Hey, first of all, I would like to thank IDB and TCA and NDAG uh, for the great honor in having Microsoft uh, for one session. So today, we'd like to talk about the smart manufacturing in Taiwan a little bit. Well, firstly, Microsoft is a platform provider. And as we go through the very difficult time for COVID-19, uh, we are having some lessons learned um, from the industries uh, across the world. So we're using the term, the new normal uh, these days, because we're starting to realize the way we work, the, the lifestyle we're having, uh, work or leisure are changed probably forever uh, because of the COVID-19. Uh, from the, uh, everyday life, we're wearing the mask. We're starting to exercise in social distance. We work from home uh, with a more packed schedule in the day. Uh, things are starting to see uh, some new uh, uh, new lights. And Taiwan is very lucky. Uh, we're uh, the COVID-19, the pandemic outbreak is being well managed. So we've been having the luxury uh, to still have a glimpse of the normal life. And the, most, of the, most of the workplaces are having a normal schedule. So as Microsoft, uh, we are in the time of new normal we are seeing some interesting aspects. Number one, in terms of smart manufacturing, we see the supply chain resilience. So in fact, uh, lots of companies in Taiwan are investing even more uh, during the period uh, as the means for uh, supply chain uh, optimization. As Isabel from Kerry uh, mentioned, uh, that's one of the key areas uh, for like vertical integration, diversification on the assets, the great timing uh, for some uh, good priced assets uh, to purchase. Uh, with all these, and uh, companies are in dire needs, uh, in particular uh, during the COVID-19, uh, would like to engage in some form of a supply chain integration. So uh, what does Microsoft do? From the page, we see that Microsoft uh, is holding a critical key of the digital transformation or the supply chain optimization, that is the cloud and data. So many people are talking about cloud, IoT, but what does that really mean? So I would like to use this simple slide to share with you uh, the key enabler for your digital transformation. So first of all, uh, the cloud has some infrastructure. And on top of that, we have some data platform. Data is the new currency uh, with all the project solutions uh, or change initiative we're taking. Uh, it's all about the data. And with the data, we need to uh, have some insights because uh, we can't just have a data. We can't just have the insights. We need to using the insight to identify the problem and to have some actions uh, for the ratification. So then on top of that, we have AI. And for the cloud, uh, for a more uh, a balanced view, 
Uh, we're talking about the public cloud as well as the edge on the premises. We totally understand a larger companies would like to retain some level of the data residency in-house. So that's the edge. Uh, we also understand because of your international expansion, Taiwanese company in Malaysia, Malaysia companies doing business in Taiwan and they, they have some multinational uh, needs for data exchange. Then that's come to the evolutionary need for a public cloud. So we often uh, share that with the customer uh, for public cloud, uh, you don't have to worry about the security. You don't have to worry about the privacy because this is the evolutionary step in particular uh, being, uh, being expedited uh, during the time uh, of COVID-19. So for the Azure, we're not going to deep dive today. However, I would like to share with you a lot of goodies we, we uh, heard in previous sessions, uh, digital transformation, AGV, AMR, uh, co-chain, uh, diversification, a multinational business. So with all these, uh, at the end of the day, we have to get a roll of the sleeves and get some uh, workload going. So this is the fundamental building blocks uh, that over 95% of the large uh, companies are using Microsoft Cloud. So we would like to share that with you, a very uh, top level of infra, serverless, and edge devices. And uh, for Taiwan, uh, we're very, very vibrant in terms of high-tech uh, semiconductor industries. And uh, one of the luxury by working with Microsoft is that we get to see so many customers and their portfolios. And in particular, uh, what's, what's my most enjo enjoyable uh, part of the work is to understand and share the business challenges and to see how capable we are, we can solve them. So from the TSMC, uh, the foundry manufacturing, who had hit the world top 10 capitalization just yesterday, Delta, Kista, and with all the complete value chain uh, from public cloud solution onto the edge gateway or AI inference ed edges uh, to the right. Uh, we have the most uh, successful uh, industrial uh, edge device partners uh, uh, probably in the world. Uh, we do have some Silicon presence, uh, MediaTek, and some of the USI packaging and module making, and we do have some uh, SIISB locally and uh, internationally and that uh, help us to deliver the partner and customer success. So one of the uh, projects I would like to talk uh, slightly more uh, with probably just one minute is uh, Delta Electronics. Uh, Delta Electronics has some classic uh, challenges they face. They would like to move up the top line. They would like to increase the profits. They would like to move from the box moving or hardware manufacturing business model to more practical service and solution driven business. And how do they do that? And they have a three core business line, power electronics. They have a building automation. They have an infrastructure like smart cities, uh, embracing 5G uh, telco. So they're using Microsoft data platform and as well as some of the partner solutions to quickly unify the data across the subsidiaries and use that data for some business insights and for smart uh, decisioning. And that also extend to their own uh, factories uh, in, uh, in the area of uh, Industrial 4.0. And uh, they're using like the, uh, the AI inference, uh, machine learning, uh, optical inspections. Uh, they use various of uh, cognitive search and cognitive services, mass detection, uh, uh, thermal imaging uh, for uh, some of the COVID-19 uh, healthcare uh, device uh, solutions. So this is one of the good uh, recent examples how we do the communication technology, that is 5G, uh, operation technology, that's Delta, and the IT, and that's Microsoft, and three major pillars of success uh, to be deliver uh, rapid uh, transformation. And uh, lastly, uh, on the IoT, uh, do we, we do have uh, lots of assets, so from the edge, and from so services and from some uh, package uh, free offering, as well as a mixed reality in various verticals. So on top of that, uh, across the board, uh, we need to have a, a top-notch security uh, to ensure that we have the, all the certification and all the confidence in place for you to truly engage the smart manufacturing or the supply chain integration and the digital transformation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel.
Uh, thank you, everyone. That was uh, our final speaker for the presentation. If I may also invite Isabel back uh, to our screen here in the center. Uh, we have some time left for a brief QA session. I know we saw on YouTube that um, there, was, uh, there was a question asked for an e-certification. Unfortunately, uh, we are unable to provide you with an e-certification for our webinar service, uh, unfortunately. So, so that's that. Uh, do we have any questions from our audience that you would like to uh, engage with our speakers? You're welcome to address them on the comment session uh, through our Google Meet. While you're thinking about questions, I actually have one or two questions for our speakers from both from Taiwan and um, in Malaysia. Uh, I'll start with uh, Isabel. So, so at the moment, how do you see the, um, the transformation of, of traditional manufacturing companies, uh, obviously re in relation to your, into your company, uh, going into a smarter logistic uh, process? Do you see that that's a trend coming on, or do you think we could still do some work on, on that part? Okay. We do see there are a few phases of the manufacturing. First, they are still, uh, as what just uh, presented, that they are very labor intensive, um, which is more traditional industry. But some of them are seeking to advance. So they buy a lot of equipment, or maybe AGV, maybe some of the smart equipment. They are trying to leverage that in their own warehouse or in their own factories. Uh, and another one, they are outsourcing to a third-party logistics service provider like us, which not only because I'm in this industry uh, or I'm in this business, but also I, I would think it's more of a syn synergy that because somebody knows how to leverage all these equipment and to optimize the total supply chain which I will recommend this, not only because of, again, I'm in this industry, but also I, I think that will be with the best effect. Thank you. Uh, following that, um, th we, I've been asked lately, uh, maybe this question can be addressed to Daniel, uh, what are the differences between uh, machinery cloud and public clouds such as Azure, do, is there a significant difference? Perhaps some of the audience may, may uh, be interested. Well, a public cloud is just the generic use of the uh, uh, shared uh, infrastructure and data. And the machinery cloud, uh, I think it's a subset of that setup. And another difference is that uh, I believe the machinery cloud has two legs, and sometimes we refer that as edge and cloud. Uh, or there are people call them hybrid, uh, because in the world of machinery, um, sometimes they prefer to have a local data storage, while they are they still need to solve the problem of cross-site communication, and they need to have a more powerful engine for the data and AI. Uh, so that's why uh, we we see the both use of uh, edge and public cloud. Thank you. Um, do we, I think we have a question. I'm sorry, I have to move closer to the screen uh, from, from Mr. O'Walland. There have been numerous cybersecurity incidents in impacting IoT devices and solutions. What role will government and manufacturers play to reduce such risks on IoT? Wow, this is a very good question on cybersecurity. Uh, and, and the question is addressed to, to who? It doesn't say, okay. So I suppose uh, maybe, maybe Daniel can kick off and um, if we, Dr. Yon or uh, Mr. Sim and even uh, Isabel would like to address. Yeah, well, let me to just try to help a little bit. And security is the number one uh, ask from the customers. So in particular, IoT is the most vulnerable. So I would have to say in IoT, we particularly have to pay attention to the end-to-end -end security. And uh, I have to refer to the Microsoft solution a little bit. So we have the chipset level security. Microsoft is selling a security chip, ensuring that your, the Wi-Fi from your machine or endpoint to the cloud is secure. And uh, from the uh, in the cloud, the security Microsoft is over ninety. Uh, uh, there are over ninety certification worldwide, ensuring that we're the most certified, most secure cloud uh, in the world to serve our customers. And also, there are some of the customer-owned uh, good practices. And Microsoft had over uh, 3,500 
security experts, as well as some of the easy to use solutions to help customers to be compliant, uh, not only in security, but also the privacy. So uh, hopefully uh, people can compare more uh, to take a look at the end-to-end -end security, in particular for IoT. I know that this, this is actually a very good question because just many months ago, there was a company, a very well-known international company who suffered a cybersecurity breach uh, through apparently was a USB. Uh, so, so this is a, a very good question. So there's another one. Um, what is the difference between AWS IoT Core and Azure IoT Central? Ah, thank you for the question to all the questions to Microsoft. Thank you for that. So IoT Central uh, is a very, very important invention from Microsoft. That's the most easy to use, zero programming, um, uh, SaaS solutions, meaning that if you use the IoT Central, uh, you can host multiple tenants of customers for a very, very low price. So this is, if you want to try solution, and uh, Azure IoT Central is uh, one of the best starting point. And uh, for IoT Core from AWS, um, I'm not sure it's an apple to apple comparison, probably it's slightly different. And as far as I understand, Azure IoT Central is one of the kind, the only uh, offering from Microsoft or from the similar offerings from other competitors. Okay, uh, it, it's not all about asking questions to, uh, to, to this side of, of the town. Uh, if we have any questions addressed to Dr. Yon or Mr. Sim, or perhaps Mr. Uh, Dr. Yon or Mr. Sim have a question to, uh, to our, uh, our speakers over here. Well, David, I would like to attempt uh, to answer Mr. Uh, Chu's question um, on, on cybersecurity. And I think uh, it's, it's actually um, something that probably MDT can address uh, first and foremost because we produce IoT devices, so we are sort of like uh, opening opening the floodgates to attacks. You know, so I think uh, I mean we have a lot of philosophy, a lot of uh, uh, design concept. You know how we actually minimize this. Of course, uh, first and foremost, uh, cybersecurity is everyone's problem. Uh, it's not about uh, whether what government can do or what the telecommunication provider can do. I think, I think uh, first and foremost, again, uh, most of the users are always putting this uh, burden of cybersecurity protection to government and to, um, I would say, ISP, ISP service provider, uh, internet service provider, because uh, they provide the, the internet uh, pipes and, and, and broadband. Uh, well, of course, uh, I'm not. Uh, I can't say uh, and can't comment on behalf of them. Uh, from IoT device perspective, uh, from our side, MBT, we actually built in uh, encryption um, uh, solutions uh, during wireless transmission, especially adoption of AES encryption up to 128 to 256 bit. So I would say, from endpoints transmission to um, to uh, gateway uh, and also edge devices, uh, we are quite protected. But again, of course, uh, attacks like brute force and, and, and some other means of attacks uh, are always possible, uh, depending how powerful is your server is. And of course, uh, wireless transmission is always in the air. You know, if you are able to actually sniff the, the uh, public key, you, know, you will be able always to actually look into what kind of data that you can uh, sniff and, and, and compromise the system. Of course, uh, our philosophy of that is actually we try not to um, have all the mission critical solutions to be on edge. Uh, it will be always uh, in a secure um, uh, software environment, especially when we talk about uh, Azure or even AWS or any cloud computing solution provider. This is where I think uh, 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 Microsoft has explained how um, the cybersecurity protection from Microsoft side, Azure side, has actually been uh, uh, quite forefront, you know, in order to avoid that. Of course, uh, in order to uh, further explain how normally cybersecurity are protected, there are always uh, uh, companies or service provider like Security Operations Center that you can outsource to them, you know, and uh, have them to look into your network logs and uh, they will provide you insights, you know, on whether your network security systems are compromised. So these socks are available in every country, uh, including big players from the telcos, you know, especially like uh, the likes of Tatacom, the likes of uh, uh, even uh, Huawei, you know. So they will provide you, uh, will provide organizations with these kind of services to actually uh, oversee, you know, what is happening. For example, you have an upcoming DDoS attack, you know, what you should do, how you should 
react to that and also this service provider will be able to provide this this uh, insights thank you thank you mr sim i i, I wonder if um logistics do do we have any similar um issues in, in terms of cybersecurity to in, in terms of manufacturing uh, through logistics oh definitely because you, you know there's massive data uh, in logistics and, and in all the supply chain, of course, we want a partner such as uh, Microsoft or any, uh, actually a lot of uh, uh, logistics service providers are all very aware of protecting our customers' data. So we work with uh, brand names or we develop our own systems to, to protect. So uh, just uh, advise that before you choose your logistics service provider, you can check on all the data security before signing the contract. That's very important. Certainly. Um, okay, Dr. Dr. Yun, I, I don't know if you have any comments or perhaps any questions that you'd like to address uh, to us. Yeah, I can just add on on the, this uh, cyber security. I mean, I think among the four companies, DF is the smallest one. <laughs> just want to add on, I mean, always as a uh, startup, we always think that we want to develop everything, including the security. But like what Isabel mentioned early on, it's all about synergy, it's all about collaboration. So for their perspective, we actually design our own core technology on running the robot. So of course, in between the firmware into the API, we do have some encryption in between. But of course, when the whole system want to talk to cloud, want to talk to other system, this is really we work with other third party company that actually are more expert in the cybersecurity. Uh, I mean, in the past, we do have company and, and hacker try to hack on us. I mean, luckily, we do have that kind of uh, so-called arrangement that can be recover and then we can try to prevent that. So as things are moving forward, uh, technology are changing very fast. So as a technology company, we have to beef ourselves up uh, accordingly. So how we want to secure ourselves. Lah. Yeah, so that's pretty much my comment. Thank you very much, Dr. Yon. So I think due to time limitations, we will soon or shortly be concluding with, with our session this afternoon. Uh, if we don't have any more questions to our speakers right now, um, this, this will be the conclusion. Uh, once again, I would like to thank everyone participating, our speakers, our keynote speakers. Um, so thank you so much. And for, for MDEC, uh, for President Ho, thank you so much for supporting. And of course, from Taiwan, IPB, and also Startup Island Taiwan. Uh, thank you so much. So we will have more interesting uh, webinars coming up later on this year. So please stay tuned to our channel. Uh, should you have any questions uh, on uh, our webinar this afternoon on the uh, smart manufacturing, please do contact us via the comment section uh, on YouTube or uh, obviously we've closed the um, Google Meet now, but on YouTube, you feel free to write your questions down and we'll, we'll try to address it ASAP. Uh, if you are interested to download presentations from our speakers, we do have a QR code on our screen on the, on the YouTube side. Uh, please do fill in the form and we'll try our best to, to arrange a copy of the presentations to you. So thank you so much once again and um, have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.